All right, presentation's up. Hello, and you are, uh, if you are here to learn about documentation, you're in the right room. Um, the title of the presentation is Build Beautiful Documentation, uh, or Building Beautiful Documentation with Platy PS and some other things. Um, I'm not gonna show you how to actually make your documentation pretty. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to use tools that'll do most of that work for you. Uh, the rest is gonna be up to you. Do I have to click? Okay, I guess I'll click. Alrighty, so we wouldn't be here if it weren't for our sponsors, so yay, yay sponsors. A lot of great people here, um, and they're right outside the doors, and if you didn't visit with them already, make sure to stop by um, and, and talk with them. Um, even just a chit chat, they're good. They're fun people. I am Josh Hendricks. Uh, I am a principal engineer for a company called Milestone Systems. We make videos for Anlet software, but um, I am uh, not here to, to represent them. Um, I am just here as kind of one of you people. And uh, the tools that I am going to show here today, I'm not affiliated with in any way, um, not sponsored by anybody. I just really like these tools and I use them on a daily basis. Uh, my Roots in IT come from tech support. I started back in 2006 as a support engineer. Uh, and then I kind of evolved into a software developer just because I needed to understand how the software works so I could better help our customers. Uh, and now I do uh, most of my, I spend most of my time in PowerShell. Uh, I maintain a PowerShell module um, for, our, uh, for our customers and then uh, do some DevOpsy things. So, beautiful documentation. Um, I brought some examples of some documentation. These are PowerShell modules that are uh, available in the gallery. Their uh, source code is on GitHub, and their documentation is all using the same uh, kind of tool chain. Uh, so they're all using uh, mkdocs. And um, so I want to show a few examples of different sites that are built using the same toolkit. So there's PSHTML, some of these you'll, you'll be familiar with. On the, on the left, you'll see the, the configuration. Uh, for this one, it's, it's very minimal. Um, so you can get as, keep it as simple or as complex as you want. So, you know, in my opinion, these are, these are pretty docs. I like them. So why bother with documentation? Um, I mean, besides the obvious, people, you want people to understand how to use your software. Um, but why bother with online documentation? Uh, you can use comment-based help, and in a lot of cases, that's perfectly fine. That's enough. Um, but get help in the terminal is only useful if you have access to the terminal and you have that module installed. So if you want people to discover your, your tool, your project, whatever you're working on, uh, having it online and having the documentation there will help people out. It'll also help you out when people ask you questions, because if you are the maintainer of a module, uh, people are going to come to you all the time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, try to, try to, I think Scott Hanselman talks about saving your keystrokes. Um, you know, you only have a finite number of keystrokes in your lifetime. And uh, if you can, uh, multiply the value of those keystrokes by putting the documentation online and then just sending a link that's gonna you know it's gonna help a lot more people out so so it also shows that you care about a project so I know there's there's a few projects where I went to I went to figure out how to use this project how to use this tool that I couldn't find the documentation or the documentation was only in the terminal and it was sort of incomplete and it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. So, you know, if you want people to feel secure in their, their choice to use whatever you're working on, um, you know, it'll, it'll really help. And it makes you really good at your job. So when you look good at your job, you tend to get paid more. So today, uh, this is the first workshop that I've done. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that the format works out well. Um, the goal is that we'll, we'll go through this PowerPoint presentation uh, and we will um, introduce some of the tools that we'll be using. 
And then I'd love for you to open your laptops and log into GitHub. If you don't have an account, go ahead and create one um, because we can use GitHub code spaces to work on this together and, and you can follow along and do the exact same thing yourself. Um, and you'll be able to generate online documentation on your own machine. All right, so stepping through some of the tools that we're gonna talk about today, uh, the first one is Platy PS. Um, Platy PS is an interesting module. So what it'll do is take a look at the get help output from your commands. So if you build a module and then import it and then you type get help, even if you didn't put any comment based help, you'll get some you know, consistently formatted information about how to use your command. So Platy PS will take in whatever documentation you have from get help and then generate markdown files, which are plain text um, with you know, some, some custom formatting. Um, and then from there, you can edit your documentation in plain text. And then the next step would be to convert that into a MAML or MAML file, um, which I just now realized there's a connection between platypus and MAML. Um, yeah, so, so it'll convert that into MAML, which is some really obtuse looking XML uh, that you don't want to write by hand. Uh, and the value of bothering with, um, with generating that MAML file is that if you are writing a binary module, so instead of writing a script module, you're writing a, something in C-sharp, that's the only option. You need a, a MAML file. You can't do comment-based help, uh, at least not. There, there's, a, there's an extension for, uh, for Visual Studio, a NuGet package that you can add that can help you with that. But anyway, it's, uh, you'll need to generate that MAML file for a binary module, but also if you're gonna do any localization. So you can't do localization with comment-based help. Perfect. Uh, so Sean Wheeler in the back is the Microsoft uh, Docs uh, expert for PowerShell and has uh, added that um, the whatever content is in your MAML file, that's gonna override any comment-based help that you might have. So that's good input, thank you. So it's also, uh, just another point, it's also a lot easier to edit. So if you are working with a team and maybe not everybody as, as comfortable in PowerShell as you are, they might not wanna go into your PS1 files and edit the comment-based help there. Um, it's a lot more comfortable to go in and edit a markdown file for a lot of people. Um, and you also, if you're using version control, there's value in having your source code and your documentation in two separate files. You can edit them without collisions. So you can have somebody updating the documentation while you're updating the command. And then when you guys do a, a merge, it doesn't blow up in your face. So the next tool in the chain is something called mkdocs. Um, so this is a Python-based static site generator. There are a lot of these uh, static site generators in general. Um, so we, I can introduce a few more of those. Um, we're gonna talk about mkdocs today. There are other tools out there if you're more comfortable with those and you can pretty much just swap them, swap them in. So uh, this will take your markdown files and then just spit out a website. Um, and then there's a lot of extensions for, uh, for mkdocs to, uh, to do things like introduce RSS feeds and, and all kinds of things. So it's got a, a large community um, and a lot of different themes. But my favorite theme is material for mkdocs. So this is a really healthy and active community. Um, the project is, uh, it has multiple contributors now. Um, it's a very flexible, customizable uh, theme for mkdocs. Uh, and the way that they, the way that they maintain the, or handle funding is that they have, it is all MIT licensed and it's open source, but they have an insiders channel 
and then they have the public channel. Okay. Um, so the insiders, uh, access to insiders is pay to play. So you, you sponsor um, MKDocs if you want to, if you see value in supporting them or accessing those features. Uh, and then you get early access to features. And then once they hit funding goals, um, they'll go ahead and release those features into the main product. And so the free version that you can just pull down from uh, um, uh, PyPy uh, that is updated on a regular basis and free to use and enjoy. Uh, so the next tool is gonna be GitHub. So we're gonna use that for a few things. Uh, version control, uh, which if you're not using yet, uh, it's scary to get started using Git, and, and I understand that. Um, really try to get started with version control. It's, uh, it helps immensely. Um, so, but besides version control, they also have uh, GitHub Actions, which if you hear me say pipeline or workflow or GitHub Action, in this context, they're all the same thing. So GitHub is going to provide us a way to run scripts automatically when we update our code. So we can set up triggers, whether it's just pushing our code up to GitHub or you know, something more uh, complex, like if we create a tag, like a v1.0 tag, you can set up a GitHub action to do something when that happens. You can use anything you want. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along with me in, uh, in GitHub because it's, uh, GitHub Code Spaces is going to help us by providing us all the exact same environment to work in uh, where the prerequisites are already set up. You don't have to install anything unless, yeah, no, you can just open up a web browser and use VS Code from there. So you don't have to install anything at all. So there's the version control, there's GitHub Actions, and then there's uh, GitHub Pages. Um, which is free web hosting. So you can um, host a static website on GitHub using GitHub pages, and mkdocs is just going to do that for you. There's a command to just, uh, I forget, something mkdocs gh deploy or something like that, and then it just shows up on GitHub. So um, free web hosting using GitHub pages. And that's kind of the end of the, uh, the PowerShell point of the workshop. Um, so if you are, if you're gonna follow along, go ahead and start up your browser and go to uh, joshuaj.com slash docs dash workshop. Um, we'll have a website there. Oh, the Wi-Fi. So it is PSH Summit. And then the password is the same thing and then 24 exclamation mark. Well, easier if I write that down, huh? Uh, where am I? All right, so this is kind of set up in order and I figure we'll go through um, uh, interactively through the workshop. If you are able to follow along while, uh, while I'm doing, doing it up here, that's great. And um, I'm assuming uh, after the break, um, then we'll be able to spend some more time uh, maybe doing, answering specific questions, trying different things out. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just, Figure it out as we go along. All right. So we're gonna go back and forth between looking at 
the documentation in the website, by the way, this is generated using mkdocs. So the GitHub project that we, uh, we have up here in the top right. So this is the, this is the workshop. All the materials are here and then when I update anything in the docs folder, then it shows up on the internet. Uh, let me close that. Oh, I moved some images around. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the scaffolding. Uh, when I say scaffolding, I'm talking about the format of your, your files and folders in your project. Um, and the tool that I used to just kind of bootstrap this project was, um, uh, I always forget, it's not plaster, it's uh, stucco. So there's a, a module called stucco that uses plaster uh, for templating, uh, which is a pretty cool little module that lets you define kind of the format of the, the project that you want, and then it'll answer a few, or ask you a few questions, and then just spit out the, the, the scaffolding of the project. So I used, um, I used Stucco to generate sort of a base, and then I built up upon it from there. Um, and then just so that you know what some of the, the folders and files are in this project, because I know it's kind of disorienting when you look at a new project on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, there's a, there might be a .cache folder that's just for temporary files associated with the process of building um, the documentation, uh, and uh, mkdocs will create that. There is a .config folder with a file in there that is for um, the .NET CLI, so in case you run this on your machine and you don't have um, the .NET CLI installed, it'll automatically get installed into that folder. Um, or into, excuse me, it'll get installed into the cache folder. The .NET tools JSON file just says, hey, here's a tool that this project wants. And so it'll automatically get installed during bootstrapping. Um, there's a dev container folder. Um, that is what allows us to use GitHub code spaces, or if you just wanna run this on your machine, you can use dev containers in VS Code, and it'll be the exact same environment. So it'll, it'll have a Docker file that describes the environment, um, what dependencies there are, and then just go ahead and spin that up for you. Uh, let's see, there's the GitHub workflows folder. So that's where we put our, um, our workflows, our pipeline definitions that say what to do when um, uh, we push something to GitHub or there's a pull request or something. And then there's some configuration in the VS Code uh, folder. Uh, the docs folder is the root for the actual documentation. So all the markdown files are gonna be in the docs folder. And also uh, assets like images and any files you might have that you wanna make available to download from your docs. Those will go into the docs folder. Um, now there's a docs workshop folder. This, is, uh, this has a sample module that we'll play with. So that'll be the source code for the module in that folder. Uh, output is when we actually build the module uh, or the documentation, it's gonna go into the output directory. Um, that won't get committed to the, repo the repository. Um, so yeah, the common pattern is to use your git ignore file to say which files and folders you don't want in your source code, you know, temporary files and things like that. And then we have a sandbox directory. So that'll be where um, you'll generate your own module uh, in the course of this workshop and do whatever you want. Actually, do whatever you want in the entire repository. Um, the whole thing is a sandbox, but specifically, uh, I'll put that there for you. Uh, tests, we'll have some pester tests in there. Pester isn't a part of this workshop, um, but uh, feel free to play with uh, pester and, and the test folder whenever you like. Uh, the repository is gonna stay online um, indefinitely, so you can play with this at home if you are that interested uh, after three hours of it in here. So, uh, let's see, I think else super important in here, we have um, the mkdocs.yaml file. So that'll be the configuration for your documentation, so for what you want mkdocs to do. 
So the title of the site, any extensions, any plugins, um, the theme configuration, that'll all go in that file. Then we have our Saki file. Um, there's other ways to build modules, uh, or you don't have to build them at all. Um, but I use Saki to separate things into tasks, and then Saki will run those tasks for me, and it's all in PowerShell. The Saki file is, is what uh, invoke Saki looks for um, when I want to do a build or a, uh, there's a serve command that you can use to serve the documentation instead of using the mkdocs command, but you can use both. Yes. Yeah. No, thanks, I appreciate it, Mike. Me either. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Mike. So are you entering the, the password, but then it's just not really working? Oh, so, oh, interesting. Oh, I'm glad I was here first. <laughs> I might not have had Wi-Fi. It was at least a minute or two before the, uh, uh, the access code uh, thing came up. So you, you just have to go out to the side and kind of wait. And uh, yeah, it's an early thing. It's just working. I try to know what that means for like a second. All right, everybody DDoS the Wi-Fi. Go for yeah. it. All right, and then, um, so some of the components of this repository, uh, again, aren't the focus for this workshop. I can talk about it if we have time, um, but there's a, uh, there's a version.json that I use with uh, nerdbank.git versioning that automates the, the process of, of figuring out what my modules version is gonna be when I publish. So rather than manually going in and, and setting the version or um, you know, maybe asking PS Gallery what the most recent version is and then just bumping it up one from there, that's a, a good option too. Um, but I started using nerdbank.git versioning to, uh, it, it looks at your git height to determine what the version is gonna be. So if you have 23 commits since the last time you published, then it'll go ahead and make it version whatever dot 23. Uh, and so everybody will have a consistent um, version uh, and it'll be easy to know what commit that came from. Um, so, all righty. And then just a, a quick review of some of the tools. Uh, we already talked about kind of a high level uh, of the tool like MKDocs and Platypus. Um, these are some of the modules and tools that are used in this repository in some way or another. Um, so we have uh, for the building process, there's build helpers, there's uh, PowerShell build, Saki, uh, PS depend is taking care of our um, bootstrapping and making sure that we have the dependencies we need in order to run the project. My goal when I work on a project in PowerShell is to, or any project, regardless of the language, is that no matter whether you're running it on your machine or you're running it in a pipeline, whether it's Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions or Jenkins or whatever. Um, I just want one entry point into the process of building the module, so I don't want to 
edit scripts in a YAML file, but then also if you're a developer doing the build on your machine, you build it some other way. I want everybody to have a consistent entry point to build the module uh, and also have the dependencies that they need. And I don't want to say like, okay, go install this and then you need to install this. Here's where you configure that. I just want everything to be automatic and working. So PS Depend helps um, with the, the PowerShell side of that. And let's see. Yeah, so the documentation's there as far as the, the modules that are in use here, but we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, so GitHub code spaces. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, the code space through a separate account just to show you what it looks like if you're not me, the owner of the module. Um, so if I go to, I'll go to the docs, Joshua J. There we go, so if we start from the website, we can click on the repository at the top right in the, uh, the menu, or in the header. Um, so you'll end up on GitHub at Joshua J slash docs workshop. Uh, from here, you can click on code, and then you can't open a code space yet because you're not logged in. So I'll go ahead and sign in. Oh, come on. And then we'll do multi-factor authentication. Okay, now that we're logged in, you can go to code and then code spaces. And I already have one running here. I'll create a new one. A code space, if you've worked with containers, so with Docker before, they are Docker containers or probably container D or something. They're containers that are running up on GitHub servers rather than your own machine. Um, that's, that's essentially what they are. So over here, when it shows that I have uh, a, a workspace already running uh, or a code space already running, um, that's just a container that I can reuse and connect to and it'll stay like the state of that container. Uh, it'll go to sleep and then I'm only paying for the, the storage that that container uses. Uh, and then when I'm using it, I'm paying a very small amount for, for the hours that I'm, I'm using it. Um, did I, yep, there it is. So I just clicked to create a code space and now it's starting up. And the first time you start it up, it's gonna take a little bit because it's gonna automatically install the dependencies. Uh, while it's doing that, I'll show you how that works. So in the dev container, let me make this a little bigger. So in the dev container configuration, and I, I, can't, I can't express how much I love dev containers when it comes to just making it really easy to collaborate on a project with somebody. Um, it just helps other developers get started really quickly. They don't have to set up a build machine. Um, I know there was uh, some old uh, projects uh, at my employer where like you had to run a giant script to set up your build environment and it had all kinds of dependencies on file shares that you had to have already had set up and uh, Windows permissions and things and it was just super complicated. Um, this is so much easier. Uh, you can get started doing what it is that, that you do right away rather than spending maybe days trying to get a build working on your machine. Um, so it's starting up and in this 
dev container file, uh, dev container JSON, it's describing how we want this dev container to work. So it's saying we want it to be based on this Docker file that's in the same folder and go ahead and install these features. And it's gonna expose a couple of ports that we'll be able to access. And then down here, uh, there's a couple of, um, after the container is created, it'll run a command. Uh, and then after it's started, it'll run this and that's bootstrapping the environment. So if we, Yep. Yeah, no, that's okay. Oh, I'm sure you're not. So if you've, uh, if you've gone to the repo, uh, you can, um, it, did you, you cloned it? Okay. Okay, so uh, the best way to interact is gonna be to, to use GitHub code spaces and rather than cloning it to your machine, um, you would click on uh, code. That's okay. Uh, and then, yeah, click on the little plus and you can create a code space. There's also a, a link here on the preparation page on the website. Um, that's a deep link to go straight to GitHub and create a code space. So the value of, you can clone it to your machine and you can run it from there and that's great. Um, the, if you have Docker already on your machine, then you can use the dev container without using GitHub at all um, and, and that's totally fine. Uh, but yeah, just for making sure that we don't have to worry about everybody getting the right dependencies on their machine, getting the right version of Python installed or something. Yeah, the code spaces will be the way to go. Yeah, no worries. Did I, did I close that? I must have. Alrighty, so my dev container should be ready to go. And under the ports tab, I would normally only have two, I think because I had opened it a few times and maybe opened it on my own machine, it created a few more, but that's all right. All right, so now I'm gonna go back to the documentation. And, uh, right, so. We're gonna jump down to uh, the mkdocs section. So we'll start talking about uh, mkdocs and uh, create a little sample project. Um, so again, this is just uh, some examples of the modules um, that uh, we had in the, the presentation. And if we go to show help, um, you should in your dev container be able to just run mkdocs-h and see something. If you don't, then it's not working yet. And I think for the presentation, I'm gonna switch to using VS Code on my machine, but it's still connecting to um, the dev container. So uh, if you want to do the same, you can click on this uh, little hamburger menu up here and go to open VS Code, uh, open in VS Code desktop. And then if you have the, uh, the plugin or the extension installed, or if you don't, it'll probably ask you to install it. Um, then it'll ask if you want to allow GitHub Code Spaces to open that address. I'll say open. And then I'm going to have the exact same code space, but it's in my VS Code on my machine, and it's just a little more comfortable than doing it in the browser. All right, and then I should be able to safely Alt-Tab. All right, so hopefully this isn't too incongruent, but I'll be alt tabbing between the uh, the web page and uh, VS Code uh, as we go. So yeah, you should be able to run mkdocs 
I'm going to close that tab so it doesn't alt tab into it. mkdocs-h, yes, we have it installed, perfect. Um, so let's go ahead and create a new website. We're going to create a new mkdocs project. So I'll type in mkdocs new, uh, and I'm going to put it in the sandbox folder. Um, and just a reminder, we're gonna, we're gonna step through these tools and how to use each one, but then the goal is that you don't actually have to touch them. You just set up your pipeline and then everything's automatic. Um, but you know, I want you to feel comfortable with, uh, with each of the tools that are in that pipeline um, so that when things don't work, you can figure out why. All right, mkdocs, new sandbox. All right, so then it says it wrote a configuration file and then created this docs folder. So let's go take a look at that. You might, with code spaces, with VS Code connecting into a code space or a dev container, sometimes you might need to hit this refresh button, at least on my machine I've noticed that, um, when you create files outside of, or from the terminal, for example. So that command that we just ran, mkdocs new, it created a, a little sample markdown file, so this will be our, our home page, and then our configuration. And that's the entire configuration for this website right now. So it's just the name of the site in an mkdocs.yaml file. And now we can use the mkdocs serve command to serve that website locally on our machine so that we can see what it looks like, we can experiment with it in real time and, and just see those changes and, and kind of craft our, our web pages the, the way that we want them to look. So I'm gonna copy that command and run it. And of course it didn't copy the whole thing, or didn't copy it at all. There we go. So mkdocs serve, and now it is built showing our documentation, and we get a little pop-up saying, hey, you're running uh, something just started listening on port 8000, do you wanna open it? Sure. All right, so there's our website. So now we are running, uh, we ran mkdocs to create a, a, just a, a template for a website um, for documentation. Uh, we ran mkdocs serve, and now we have a little web server on our dev machine that is allowing us to see what that documentation looks like. So this is what that markdown looks like when it's rendered into a web page. Okay. So now we're gonna add some content. And again, we can just go down to the bottom of the add content section in mkdocs. And I'm gonna copy the command. This is just gonna scaffold out like a, an about page and a contact page some um, and some other things just to see what that looks like. So again, this is what our page looks like right now. I'm going to paste this into a fresh terminal. And so now we just have some empty files here. And our website is already updated um, on our dev machine so we can see what that looks like. So you can see your changes in real time. It'll automatically monitor those files and then refresh. All right, so now we get to play a little bit um, and, and try out some themes. So again, I, I mentioned mkdocs is my favorite theme. We can see what that looks like. Oh, is that the wrong place? There it is. So in my sandbox, I can go to mkdocs. There we go. Uh, you shouldn't have to run the pip install command here. So themes in mkdocs are, uh, they are Python packages. So you, if you want to use a new theme, you can use pip install and the name of the package for that theme, and then it'll become available. And then in your, mkdocs file, you can just specify the name of the theme, 
And if that package is there, it'll use it. If it doesn't, then it will fall back to, I think, the default mkdocs theme. So let's go ahead and use the Dracula theme. Okay, I just hit Control S. And maybe I didn't install it. Okay. Well, then I will copy and paste this pip command. And that'll go out and just pull down a few themes for us to play with. And let me hit control S, control S there again. Alrighty. So my, my Dracula theme is installed. Um, yeah, there it is. So we have our getting started pages. Uh, and yeah, so it's as easy as that. Um, just make sure your theme that you want to use is installed and uh, then specify the name there. I'm going to put material here. And that's what it looks like with the material theme. So you can play with all kinds of themes. Um, you know, material is my favorite, but that's not going to be the, the best theme for every purpose. Um, so you can go to, uh, in the theme section here, if you click on catalog, there are a whole bunch of MKDocs themes and extensions that are uh, listed here. This is a, um, this is under the MKDocs organization, so somebody's maintaining this, and um, if you want to find out what other extensions there are, themes, you can go here and try them out. And I keep losing my place. There we go. All right. So there are a few other commands in MKDocs that we can use, but we won't go into detail on those right now. Uh, but we have MKDocs uh, serve that will serve the, the page or the documentation that we, we want to see. Uh, we have build and that'll just generate the HTML and then you can zip that up and put it somewhere. I used to um, use Netlify instead of GitHub pages and so I had a, something in my pipeline that would build the docs with MKDocs and then zip it up and then upload it over to Netlify and then it would just automatically show up in Netlify. Um, uh, there's all kinds of ways you can serve your documentation. You could use an S3 uh, bucket or Azure um, static websites, web apps. I haven't used those yet, but um, yeah, you were asking if, uh, if you had to use GitHub, absolutely not. You can use DevOps or any other um, uh, tool for uh, building your, your project and any web server you want for hosting the, the actual documentation. All right, so Platypus. Um, again, this is the tool that we're going to use to take our PowerShell module and build some documentation in Markdown so that we can turn that into a website. Uh, and then it's also, so it kind of branches from there. You use Platypus to generate the Markdown for your website, and that same Markdown will be used to make the MAML file that PowerShell will uh, package in with your module when you publish it or uh, whatever you do with it. So you can use any module you want, um, but there's a little sample module. I can, uh, uh, dad jokes module. So it's using the I can has dad joke uh, API. So we'll have a couple of commands. And uh, anyway, you can copy and paste this. This is our, the whole module in one file just so that you can um, copy and paste and, and then it'll just show up in your, your project. Okay, so what that did was in our sandbox, it created a dad jokes folder, a manifest for our module, 
and the module file with our functions. And then it exports those functions so they're available in the terminal. So now we can do uh, get dad joke. Yeah. And if we type get help, we have our comment based help here. Um, so if you haven't used comment based help, I'll show how that shows up there in the terminal. So comment based help is this block of text here. So we add a comment in a certain format um, and then PowerShell will go ahead and see that that exists and then when you do, when you use get help, it will fill everything in for you. Um, so a lot of cases, you know, not to um, uh, gatekeep or anything, like you could, this could be enough depending on the project. Uh, certainly for, for this module, uh, comment based help is more than enough. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you can, um, you know, sometimes you don't need to, to bother with the whole shebang and, and get online documentation up and running. Um, I have no idea, I have not memorized how to write comment based help. I use VS Code and the snippet and it does it for me. So if I just do uh, function, uh, is it not going to do it automatically for me here? Probably because I'm running my web page in the PowerShell extension. There we go. Oops, mkdoc serve. Uh, what was it? relaunch my documentation there. Um, now I should be able to type function and then I get these snippets. Let's say I want an advanced function, uh, do a thing. And then when I want to add comment based help, I can type uh, hash symbols and it just shows up. I think it's like two uh, pound signs, and then it just scaffolds out your comment based help for you. So if you fill in the comment based help, um, it will automatically show up in the documentation when you build uh, or when you run Platypus. Um, the markdown files that Platypus generates will include your comment based help. Uh, typically, if I do that, if there is already the comment based help in a project, I'll run Platypus, and then the markdown becomes my source of truth. I will go in and delete the comment based help from my source code because you don't want your documentation living in two places. So if you prefer to use comment based help, that's fine. You could keep using that and then let that be your source of truth. Don't edit the markdown. Or you can edit the markdown and then get rid of your comment based help either way. Um, but just, just so that you don't get confused, you, you really want to pick one or the other. All right, so we have our module. Now we want some markdown files that uh, have our documentation. So in order for Platypus to generate the markdown, it needs to have the module imported. So it needs to be available. So if you, um, if it's not in your, um, your current user path for where PowerShell automatically goes to find modules or the all users path, um, you wanna make sure to import it explicitly 
so that it's available and then you can run your new markdown help command. So what we have here is we're calling new markdown help. We're telling um, Platypus what module we want help for and then it's going to find all the commands that are in that module and generate documentation and put them all in this commands folder. And then force, I think, if the file already exists, it'll overwrite it, um, which I have a little comment here. Um, you wanna be careful with new markdown help. This is one of the values of using version control is that when you accidentally overwrite the help file that you just spent hours editing um, with, with an empty help file, uh, having version control is gonna save your bacon. Uh, don't ask me how I know. All right, so we'll run new markdown help. And it tells me it just created a couple markdown files. So if I look in my sandbox under docs, commands, there they are. So you'll notice for commands that don't have comment-based help, you'll see this fill in the synopsis, fill in the description, these placeholders. Um, so it stubbed out the documentation for us, but you know it's not gonna write it for you. you, you if you want that, you need to go to one of Doug Fink's presentations on AI and PowerShell, and then maybe you can automate the, uh, the generation of your documentation. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you still need to do a little bit of work there. But the get dad joke command, it had comment based help. So it showed up in our markdown file. Uh, and by the way, we're running our documentation over here. So if I go to commands, it's already there. So that's what it looks like when you take your, your platypus files, your markdown files that platypus generated, and then build them into a web page. Again, you can play with the themes and see what the different, um, uh, see what the documentation looks like in different themes. You can also uh, modify your existing theme. There's, um, depending on which one, which theme you're using, there's, there could be any number of customizations you can do with material for MKDocs. There is a ton of customization that you can do in terms of the, uh, uh, the CSS, uh, you don't have to get into the CSS. You can do some things in your, your mkdocs.yaml file. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of flexibility there, which we won't get into today. Um, so we generated new markdown help, but there are two parts um, or two things that you need to do with Platypus when you're maintaining a module, adding commands, updating things. Um, new markdown help will generate the new files, but it's not going to update existing files. Um, so there's an update markdown help that'll do that. And if they'll let me scroll, there we go. So in the platypus section under update markdown help, um, we're gonna add a command to um, one of the jokes or one of the functions uh, and then, or not a command, we're gonna add a parameter to one of the commands and then just see what happens when we run update markdown help. So I'll go into my source here. Uh, that would be sandbox, dad jokes and in the PSM1 file, I'll add a second parameter, hit save, and then I'm gonna copy this. Uh, well, that's not the right command. So we're gonna use update markdown help and uh, that's not the right command so don't copy and paste that. Do update markdown help. There we go. So path and we'll put in the path to the file that we wanna update. So what this is gonna do 
is we're going to provide the path to the markdown file that we want to update. In order for Platypus to figure out what to do, you need to have the module imported so that when it looks at that markdown file, it's going to take a look at this front matter. So when you look at the top of a markdown file, if you see something that looks like YAML like that, that's um, called front matter. Uh, or you, so it might be called metadata in some contexts. Um, so it's going to look at this and say, OK, this command, this documentation is for the dad jokes module. Um, and because it has a very specific schema for how this markdown file is formatted, it's going to you know, see the, the command name and know which command to look up the get help for in order to update the contents of the, the markdown file. So because we modified the module, we need to update it in our session here. So import module dash force, because we already have the module imported, but we just modified it. So we're going to do dash force to tell PowerShell, no, we're like, we really want you to go look at that and import it again. So if I do git help, git dad joke, we should see, yep, there's a platy ps test parameter now. Um, so now if we do update, Markdown help path, and that's going to be in docs commands. Um, docs commands. Oh, it's going to be in sandbox docs commands. Okay, so we'll do update markdown help to the Markdown file, and it looks like it did something. So if we go back to the documentation page, it's updated now. So it's gone in and inserted that parameter into the documentation that we just added. So what it won't do is, uh, let's see, if you have comment-based help in your command, um, in the source code, and then you changed that and you expected it to show up, in the, the markdown file that Platypus updated. I don't think it's going to do that, uh, but it will look at uh, if you've removed a parameter, if you've added a parameter, uh, if you've changed the type. So if we change this from a string to an int, then it's going to update those sort of machine readable um, parameters or properties of the, the markdown file. Um, and if we scroll down, we should see um, yeah, we now have the placeholder there. So now we can go in and fill in our documentation. Um, and in your, in your pipeline, you might have a pester test that looks for this pattern for these placeholders so that you don't accidentally publish documentation that isn't complete. Um, so yeah. There we go. All right, so this is where um, I might have Sean uh, add a little bit of context, uh, but I have a note here on this progress action preference. So if we go back to the documentation that this made, we see this progress action parameter, and it's expecting us to fill in some documentation on that. Um, and then it has this, block of common parameters like debug and error action, error variable. So in PowerShell 7.4, uh, the progress action um, parameter was introduced as a common parameter. So every commandlet that you, you write in, and use in PowerShell 7.4, you have the option to, um, to specify the progress action. That wasn't, that didn't exist when the version of Platypus that's available right now uh, was made. So um, it doesn't know, it sees progress action on the command, and so it just generates a parameter for it in the documentation. Um, it's hard-coded in the PSM1 file in the, in the module for Platypus. So we'll, we'll talk about a few options that you have, but um, yeah. yeah. That's right, right. So, so what Sean added was that um, in the next version of PlatyPS, they are going to include progress action. Uh, 
in as a common parameter, it'll be listed no matter which version of PowerShell you ran the Platypus module in, um, with a little comment saying that that, that parameter wasn't uh, available or that parameter was introduced in 7.4. So you know, even if you build your documentation from PowerShell 5, um, you'll see that in your in your common parameters list. Um, so perfect. Thank you for that. Okay, go back to here. Uh, there we go. So uh, we'll touch on GitHub Actions. So let's see, it's 10 o'clock. Um, so about a half hour until break. Um, so GitHub Actions isn't the, the you know, isn't a focus of, of this uh, workshop. Uh, but it is an important part of that pipeline uh, of getting the docs from your machine up to the internet. Um, so just to, um, so that you can see how this works um, at, a, at a high level, we have a docs.yaml file that describes what we want GitHub to do when we um, um, update our documentation. So it says that uh, we, on a Workflow dispatch, which is just when you click the button in the in the web interface, um, we want it to do something. We also want it to do something when there is a push um, to the main branch, and any of these files are modified. So, uh, by putting a little filter here for the paths, that makes it so that we don't necessarily rebuild our docs every time we make a small change to a command in the source code that doesn't impact the documentation. Um, sometimes you might still want to at least build the docs just to make sure that you haven't broken something because uh, Platypus will get very particular if you um, if you modify your markdown files for your commands in a way that those those markdown files no longer match the schema, then Platypus is going to throw an error and your documentation won't build. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's important to to make sure that you uh, you run that periodically just to make sure your your pipeline's still going to work. Uh, and then jobs uh, just describes the the different tasks that we want to to perform. Um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, run this on Ubuntu. And uh, there's some permissions here to tell GitHub that it's okay for this um, this pipeline to write to a branch in GitHub. Because what mkdocs is going to do is when you publish uh, with the gh publish command, it's going to generate your documentation files, like the, the HTML files, and then it's going to push those to a branch um, called gh pages by default, I think. Uh, and then I have a little uh, cache step here that's optional, but that just helps uh, on a larger project. To um, you can use GitHub's cache feature to kind of accelerate the the build process, so you don't have to download the same things every time the pipeline runs. It'll say, "Oh, yeah, I already cached that. I'm going to pull that into the pipeline and and reuse that." Uh, and then it's just going to run build uh, with the bootstrap command, and then um, yeah, the publish docs task. All right, so let me show. Uh, so I was talking a little bit earlier about how I like to have uh, the same entry point into the build process, whether I'm doing it on my machine or a dev container or uh, through a pipeline. Um, so that build command is in our source code. We have our build script here. Uh, this was, I didn't, write this, uh, I might have made some changes to it, but um, this was part of the scaffolding that uh, the stucco module did. So um, that was written by Brandon Olin, um, Dev Black Ops. Um, the version of it that I'm using though is a fork of stucco that fixes some things because he hasn't updated the module in a little while. Um, and the bootstrap command is what makes it so that if we're on a fresh environment, it'll go ahead and make sure that we have um, the right Python uh, packages installed and PowerShell modules uh, in order for our, our project to build. But you don't need to use Bootstrap every time. So if I do 
actually let me go over here and kill our web server. Let's make a quick correction to the docs and then we can see in the GitHub pipeline, um, we can see it get updated. So I think it was under PlatyPS and then update. Yes. So if we update our documentation, let me make sure I'm using the right command. Path, sandbox, uh, docs, commands, get dad joke. I don't think I needed anything else. What other parameters do we have? Nope, that's all I need. There we go. All right, now I have the right command in my documentation. I just hit Control S to save. Uh, did I make a change? Nope. I can discard that change in my README file. There we go. So that's the change we're going to make. Um, use the right command, dummy. Okay, so I just committed that change locally. And by locally, I mean out there somewhere because this is a GitHub code space, um, but it's not in the repository yet, so I'll sync changes, and that's going to push that to my main branch. And if I go back to GitHub, there we go. So I can see my commit here, and I have this little pending status. So uh, what does that mean? I'll click on that and it says, oh, it's in the process of building the docs. Cool. Let's go to the details. So under the actions tab in the repository, um, we can see that the task is running. Um, I think the warnings are fine. In a production project, I'd probably try to make sure that there's no warnings uh, for this. That's fine. Okay, so it's, what is it doing right now? So it's running our, um, it's, so our, our GitHub action says that it uses the MKDocs material um, Docker container to, or Docker image in order to build the documentation. So it's gonna go out to the hub dot, uh, whatever, HubSpot, Docker's, Docker hub. Uh, it's gonna go out and pull that container down uh, and then it's going to, run our bootstrap and make sure that we have the right modules installed. And yeah, it's already done. So after that one runs, we'll see a follow-up called pages build and deployment. So this is the GitHub pages thing that ran automatically. Um, after I ran my pipeline, so my pipeline said, uh, okay, here's some documentation. We're going to push it into the, you know, whatever whatever branch you've configured in your repository to be the GitHub pages source. Um, and when we pushed into that branch, this uh, automatic um, GitHub action ran in order to make those changes available um, on the internet. So if we go back to our documentation and go to the live website, Hopefully, yep, there it is. So it's not new markdown help anymore, it's update markdown help. So that is so nice to be able to just make little edits to your documentation and be able to get them pushed and, and just magically show up on the internet like that. Um, it shows up right now under my, my domain um, because I've, I set up my blog on GitHub uh, and then it seems like it just automatically, like every repository that I have GitHub pages, um, that I'm using GitHub pages on, it will just add a, it, when I go to the, the GitHub page, it just shows up under my domain. Eh, it's magic. 
Um, but if you were to fork the repository and um, set up GitHub pages uh, for yourself, then it'd be like github.io uh, or something like that, slash, uh, and then the name of your, uh, your repository. Hey, look at that, we got a couple of forks already. Perfect. All right, um, so the GitHub pages part, if I go over to settings in my repository and go to, um, yeah, there it is, pages. So by default, this isn't going to be set up. You need to tell GitHub that you want to use GitHub pages. Um, and so the first time I ran the, the publish command to push the documentation to GitHub, uh, it created this GH pages branch in my repository. And then once that was there, I went in here and selected that branch. And then after that, it became the source for my, my GitHub pages. And so any anytime I push there now, then it'll automatically show up. If we go over to GH pages, this is the site that MKDocs built. So it just, every time you do a build and you push to, uh, to GitHub, it's going to um, overwrite the contents of this branch with the new copy of your website in plain HTML. And I, so I used to write HTML by hand like a long, long time ago. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't want to look at HTML anymore. Um, and so I love that. Uh, I, I never look at the output from from MKDocs. You're welcome to to look at the the HTML that generates. In fact, if you go into the project, and instead of MKDocs serve, you do an MKDocs build. And I'll put that in output. Uh, let me see. So again, I don't use the, the command line interface for MKDocs that often because I set it up in my project so that it just runs automatically. Um, we do MKDocs build dash H uh, and we need to tell it uh, where to put, actually no, we don't need to tell it where to put it because it has a default path. So mkdocs build. So because I'm in the, the root of the repository, it's gonna build the whole, uh, the, the main documentation. Um, so now if I look at my source, and I think it's gonna go into, yeah, output slash site. There we go. Um, so there's a documentation in HTML format. Um, I don't know why you would do that. Maybe if you're not getting what you expected, then you'd take a look at the, the HTML and try to kind of reverse engineer why you're getting the output you got. Um, but, uh, or yeah, you might use GitHub, uh, or if you're not using GitHub pages, then you would use MKDocs build in order to generate the site like this. And then you know maybe you use compress archive or some other command to zip it up or tar it uh, in uh, if you're on Linux, which we are. Um, so yeah, you can, you can go and publish that anywhere you want. Um, but how did it get to output slash site? That would be the mkdocs.yaml. So everything that mkdocs does is based on the contents of that docs folder. Uh, or wherever you tell mkdocs to look for your documentation, um, and this file. So um, for this project, we have this remote branch. Um, so this is telling mkdocs where to put our documentation when we do a, a, a publish. Um, and then if we look at our theme configuration, it's using material. Um, then you can provide, you know, logo and different colors, fonts. And with the material theme, 
Uh, this palette section is what gives us Uh, there we go. Uh, this little icon here. So now we can have the the light theme, which maybe for I'm not sure which one's better for uh, a big projector. Maybe maybe the light theme is better. Um, but yeah, that's what gives us that. And so by default, it's going to use whatever my operating system wants. Um, but then you can toggle that. Uh, go back here. Uh, and then all the rest of the documentation, honestly, start with the, your site name and you know the theme that you're using. Like that's really all you need to start with. Um, the rest will come as you start to want to change the way that your site looks or add you know other capabilities or something. Um, so it looks like a lot, but uh, you just build it up over time. So um, I added some comments here for, for what some of these things do. Uh, if you're using the material theme, use their, their website. Um, his documentation, considering it's a theme for MK Docs, uh, is, is obviously his documentation would be fantastic. So material, uh, there we go. Uh, so, Squidfunk is the username, um, and uh, Martin Donrath is the is the uh, maintainer. Uh, I really hope I got that name right. It is Martin Donrath, right? Dang it! I always forget. There we go. Yeah, Martin Martin Donrath, not Donrath. There we go. So we've got a great getting started section, um, and again, you can. Uh, you can use MK Docs for anything. It's, it's not in any way connected to PowerShell. Uh, you could have, if it's a Python project or a blog or anything you want to write in Markdown and then have a, a website on it uh, generated from it, then it's a, it's a great theme for that. Um, so have a look at the getting started section. Uh, the references, if we go in and look at things like admonitions, which are these things, so we look in the documentation, and he'll, he'll mention there, if you need an extension, a certain extension to be able to use a certain feature in the theme, uh, it'll be called out in the documentation here. And then it just says here, here's how you um, change the, the icon, for example, if you want to change the admonition uh, icon. And then here's how you put your write, write your markdown in order for that to show up the way that you want it to show up. Um, so. Your platypus file, or the, the files that platypus makes, you're probably not going to do a lot of customization in those. The only thing that I usually do is um, I'll go in and add PowerShell as um, in the code block or the code fence to tell uh, mkdocs what language is in that, um, in that, what language that code is in. So if I go to my command section here, um, you know I might do text for that, um, and I already put PowerShell there. Uh, that's about the extent to which I edit the format of the the files. Like I'm not going to put a lot of um, fancy features um, in those files because then when Platypus reads the Markdown files in order to generate the mammal for my module. It's going to throw an error um, and and not know what to do if I have a lot of weird markdown formatting. Yeah. It should only add parameters or the uh, update the parameter types, things like that. Um, but I mean, that's it's a workshop, so let's test it. So we have our uh, find dad joke command here. Um, if I do, um, I don't know, change that to YAML, hit save. Uh, yep, I'm in the right place, good. I'll open up my terminal and do build. Uh, 
Okay, so that's what the build command looks like. I didn't do a bootstrap because my environment's already bootstrapped. Um, it went and uh, staged the files, which in this project, that means it's putting, it's making a copy of my module's source code here uh, and putting it in the output directory. And then it's taking, so if you notice, in the source code, I have everything broken out into separate files. So each command is its own file, uh, but in the output, I want everything in one PSM1 file because then it's it loads a little bit faster, especially on a bigger module. So um, those commands all get squished into this PSM1 file as part of the build process on, on this project. You don't have to do that. Um, that's just a pattern that I enjoy. Um, and then, yeah, then it ran generate markdown, generate mammal, um, and if we go back to, does it find that joke? Oh, did I do that? What did I do? I'm gonna close this. Could be. Go back to, I get lost easy, there we go. Okay, I think I had hit enter or something. I'm gonna change that again, so um, JSON, sure. And I'm just gonna close that file. That's not the one I wanted. Okay, so this should say JSON. Okay, so yeah, it is doing, it's putting that on a new line. Uh, it might not be. Yeah. Uh, there, so Markdown isn't a strongly typed, like it's not treated exactly the same by every tool out there. Um, so there you will see places where a space between the back ticks and the, uh, the language is recommended or supported and apparently uh, places where it's not. So let me hit save here again and do a build. There we go, okay. So as long as you don't put a space there, then it'll keep the language. Although, yeah, okay. I'm gonna throw one in there. Yep, yeah, really doesn't like that. Um, so let's go ahead and, and break uh, Platypus. Uh, let's go ahead and put in a, a new header. Okay, there we go and see what happens when we don't stick to the schema. Oops. So, like I said, Platypus is very particular about the schema for the markdown files. Um, so as you, as you update your docs, um, you can you know, consider frequently doing a, a rebuild, at least locally, so that you know if a change that you made broke something, because then you don't have to go back to 20 different files and un undo those changes. I uh, will go ahead and undo my change, discard, rebuild, good to go. All right, we got a couple more minutes before the break. Um, and then, yeah, uh, let's talk a little bit about where you guys are at and uh, what we should talk about when we, when we come back. Um, so we can step through maybe the, the format of the project and I don't know what, uh, what that build process looks like, when, you know, what happens when we hit build, 
Um, we can play with platypus some more. Oh, you know what? We should we should talk about your options for getting that progress action parameter um, to go away. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get back. But yeah, how are you guys doing? Got any questions or? Uh, stucco, yeah, so if we look up stucco here. So here's the repository for stucco. Uh, again, I used, I think it's PS stucco, uh, so install module PS stucco uh, is the one that I use specifically for, for this, um, uh, but it's based on uh, the original repository and uh, just has a few improvements. Mm -hmm. So stucco is the thing that is creating the structure for the project and the structure for the project includes the use of um, PowerShell build. So let's look at that. Here we go. So PowerShell build is, uh, uh, they probably have a description here, but it's, it's kind of an opinionated, um, uh, a, an opinionated way of generating a module from, from documentation with a lot of um, options for customization. So if we look at um, the tasks here, so it's got, yes. Yeah, um, so it's using Saki as a framework for, um, for our tasks. So if we look at our Saki file in the source code. So we have some configuration in here in the property section, and then we declare a couple of tasks. So our default task is gonna be test, um, and then it's importing the build and test commands from PowerShell build. So this Saki file is part of my module, um, and then it is using the PowerShell build module that has definitions for these tasks in it that we're gonna borrow. So it's sort of importing those, and then I added my own serve command that is gonna go ahead and run um, the mkdocs serve command for you. Um, so yeah, that is, the thing that is managing the tasks that we're gonna run, um, but what is it? PS. There we go. Yeah, so PowerShell build is the one. So the, the build task in PowerShell build is what's taking our multiple files and then compressing them into a single PSM1 file. It doesn't have to do that. It does that because right here, I said true to compile module. Um, if you don't put that in there, then it's just going to um, take exactly what you have and make a copy of it and then the version and, and things like that will get updated in that output folder and not in your original source code. So yeah, we are at time for the break. Um, so let's take a break. Cool, and yeah, when we get back, we'll answer some, some more questions. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody is playing with this on, on your own machine, but if you, uh, if you run into an issue or, or wanna take a look at something, yeah, let's talk about it. Welcome back, I didn't scare you all away. Um, going into the second half, uh, I'm kind of winging it. Uh, we'll, co we'll cover whatever uh, whatever you guys think would be helpful um, so we can talk more about um, MK Docs or the, the theme and customization there or we can go into detail on like the scaffolding for the project which isn't necessarily connected with the documentation, but there's there's been a lot of interest in just how 
the project is structured and, and how that works and the different components of that. So whatever whatever you guys want to, uh, to cover in the second half, uh, it is up to you. Um, but I want to start with uh, a note about Platypus and the progress action preference. So um, yeah, so these were a few of the solutions that, that are available. Uh, you could just ignore it. So this, <laughs> and that's really the easiest option. Uh, it's, not, it's not that bad, but if you don't want to see this parameter in your documentation, um, then you can do the build of your docs from um, a different version of PowerShell. So whether it's 5.1 or you know 7.0 or just any other version that came before 7.4, you can use that, and then it won't show up in your docs. That's you know besides ignoring it, that's the easiest option. Um, okay. If you rerun your build, would it regenerate? So, so Sean was saying that um, you, you can obviously just remove it from the markdown. Um, and you were saying uh, during the break that it can be dangerous in some cases to use the update command uh, in more ways than, than I, I mentioned already. <laughs> so, um, so it sounds like in some cases um, you, you just would manually do the updates. And, uh, and then, so you could just manually remove it from the markdown. Okay. All right, so what Sean, and just for the, uh, for the recording, um, what Sean was saying is that if you have done some custom formatting inside your markdown files, um, the process of converting that to MAML uh, is going to lose a little bit of the fidelity um, and you know, the formatting. So then if you do an update, Markdown help command, it is going to read the documentation from your MAML file and then update the Markdown file. And so some of that is gonna get lost in the mix. So something to bear in mind. Um, so what he is suggesting is that you might do a, you might create a copy of your, um, your Markdown files and then update the copy and then copy the changes across as, as you need to. Um, that sounds like if, yeah, if you run into issues with the formatting, um, that might be a good idea. That, that's probably why I don't tend to change my documentation for my commandlets themselves all that much. You know, I, I'll update the descriptions and things, but I won't put a lot of formatting in there because, yeah, it, it can potentially either break the, the build um, and Platypus will throw an error because it doesn't know what to do or uh, yeah, you might lose some some formatting. So cool. All right, so we might see Platypus. Well, so it says V2 on the repository, but it might be version 1.0 um, sometime this year. Excellent. All right, and yeah, for the recording, uh, we were just answering the question: uh, What are the the utility modules that were maintained by Microsoft um, uh, related to PowerShell? So perfect. Okay, so where would you guys like to dive in deeper uh, in this second half? Um, we can we can look at any any part of this repository or uh, MK Docs. Yep, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, how do dynamic parameters work with Platypus? Okay, yeah. So to for the recording. Uh, dynamic parameters for um, uh, providers will be supported in the new version of Platypus. Um, so providers being like uh, the path provider, uh, get child item um, for you know your C drive or cert or uh, WS man or something. Um, but other dynamic parameters are not going to really be supported. So that's that's kind of a hard problem to solve because dynamic parameters are they are described in code, but trying to figure out what the uh, the parameter set is going to look like in a command with a bunch of dynamic parameters is that's that's a hard problem. Short answer: maybe maybe don't use dynamic parameters. <laughs> I. 
personally, I, I've, I've used them a couple of times, but I, I do avoid them, uh, not just because of how complex they are to make, but yeah, they, they just, they can be challenging to support. Okay, so, so for that module, um, for or any module really uh, where you're you're worried about sort of the fidelity of the uh, the output of your your markdown your mammal file and and everything you would probably follow the pattern that, that Sean described where you go ahead and generate your docs stub them out but then when you update them you do that by hand safely um, and and the nice thing about that is that you can then, with your dynamic parameters that you add into your markdown files by hand, um, you can go ahead and generate the, the mammal file from that. Um, and then, yeah, they'll be in, in your online documentation and your, your in terminal documentation. Yeah. All right. Um, let's. Go back into the repo and see. Just trying to decide what we should look at. So the uh, we can dive in a little bit deeper into some of the the platypus commands or uh, MK docs. Um, actually, let's do. Let's look at mkdocs for a minute here. So we have our, our build, we covered that. Um, alternate ports. So when you do an mkdocs serve for local development, um, it will by default bind to localhost on port 8000. In some cases, you might need to use a different port or you might need to listen on a different interface or all interfaces. Um, so you can do that. So if we do a mkdocs uh, serve, it is right here where you can specify uh, what to listen on. So if I want to use port 8001, I can do mkdocs serve and dash a. Thousand one. So I went ahead and built and served and says, "Hey, something just started listening on 8001," and there. So um, on my local machine, I tend to uh, use the dash a or dash dash dev addr um, because I'm running it in a container and localhost, I think it causes a problem. I, I need to listen on all interfaces so that I can access it from outside the container or something. Anyway, um, there's some flexibility there. Uh, so for uh, deploying to GitHub, it's the gh-deploy uh, command. And it's going to, I think it looks for a token. Uh, it might Trying to remember, you can run that on your local machine if you want to, um, and you just need to make sure that you have, a, I think, an environment variable or something for your your GitHub token so that you can you can push those changes into GitHub, um, or if you just run it in your um, GitHub Actions pipeline, then it'll go ahead and use the token that's in the GitHub Action session, and then it'll have the permission it needs, and that is why. In my docs workflow, I add that there. So, um, principle of least privilege: you don't want to give full permissions to every thing that you run. So, this you know pipeline has limited permissions, and then in here, I'm declaring that yes, I want this to be able to write back to the the repository uh, from this workflow, but then my CI workflow doesn't have that permission because it doesn't need it. Uh, we were talking during the break a little bit about um, like PowerShell build and Saki versus invoke build um, and, and sort of the differences. Uh, I haven't used invoke build because um, I, I sort of discovered the um, the stucco module and the Saki way of doing things first and just kind of stuck with that. 
um, but invoke build is great too, uh, and it's it's still widely used. Um, and in fact, the PowerShell build uh, module that has the build and, and test tasks for Saki uh, that I'm using in this repository, uh, it also has tasks for invoke build. So whether you're using um, Saki or invoke build, it, uh, you could use the same PowerShell build module to sort of import those tasks so you don't have to write those yourself. Um, Let's see. Let's play a little bit with MKDocs. Um, we've got the site running still, I believe. Let's go back up here. Ports. I'm feeling very claustrophobic because <laughs> I've got a I've got an ultra wide monitor at home. So yeah, this is this is tough for me. Uh, let's. Open our documentation up here. Nope, not running. All right, build, serve. There we go. So we've got our site running. Um, we'll take a look at the, uh, the configuration file here again. So with the material theme, um, like I said, take a look at the material website, their documentation, uh, and they'll go into detail about these theme features that are, that are here. Um, but you can, uh, for example, uh, this one is really handy to just have on every project that you do with PowerShell because if you, want people to just be able to copy and paste the examples. Um, that's the feature that gives you this little copy icon. So if I take that away, it gets a lot more annoying to uh, try to borrow code. Then you have to copy and paste it by hand and who wants to do that? Okay, and there's other features like um, instant navigation. So especially on a larger project, but maybe not too large, um, when you go from one page to another, uh, let me disable instant real quick and see if we even notice. Oop. All right, so one page to another. Okay, so you can see some loading time uh, when I go from one page to another, um, and you know it's not that bad, but you can get a better experience by enabling instant navigation. And I also enabled this uh, dot progress feature, which will show a little progress wheel so that you know when the page is finished loading. And what that does is turn it into a SPA, a single page application, so that um, when you go to the website, basically all of the pages are loaded in the background, and then when you jump from one page to the next, it's a lot faster. So there's less loading time, and it just feels a little bit, a little bit speedier. Um, the trade-off is that the initial page download is bigger, so you know it's whatever works for, for you and, and the people that are using your documentation. Um, there are options in the configuration to um, to only, let me see, I think what they do is they will, so say we're looking at one of these commands, you can make it so that the instant loading will be limited to the scope of the section that you're in, so that when you switch from one command to the next, um, those are already preloaded, but maybe other sections of the website aren't preloaded. So that helps to minimize the amount of um, the, the size of that initial page load um, if you stick to the same section in your, in your documentation. Um, 
I like to use the privacy plugin. So what that'll do is a lot of times when you, well, pretty much any website you go to, if you open up the, the F12 developer console and you look at this network tab, you're gonna see requests to all kinds of different websites um, that aren't yours. So uh, they might be fonts from Google, they might be you know, tracking things and whatever. Um, the privacy plugin, I think it was introduced for GDPR reasons, just to help people build documentation that complies with GDPR. Because if somebody goes to your documentation and then your documentation has, you know, depends on a resource that's on another website, well now that other website knows that you've visited that documentation and maybe you don't want your IP address and your, your you know, the, the stuff that you're doing on the internet being recorded by other, other websites. You went to this doc site, you don't want Microsoft knowing that, that you went there, maybe. So uh, the privacy plugin will automatically, it'll look for uh, in, your, in your markdown if you reference images that are on other websites or fonts in your configuration. Uh, it will go ahead and download those during build so that they're already embedded in the documentation that's produced. So that, you know, if we, if we look through here, these are all coming directly from my local uh, dev environment. It's not pulling down resources from outside. Um, it already downloaded those fonts for me. So, so then the social plugin, um, this is what gives you social cards. So when you share a link to your documentation on social media or you know, in an instant message or something, uh, you'll notice a lot of times it'll automatically render kind of a preview of that website. Those are social cards. So what happens is MKDocs will go ahead and build an image that represents the preview for that page. And it's highly configurable, um, but the, the default is pretty good. Um, so you can create social cards and then that way when you, when you share links to somebody, it just kind of looks cool. You put it on LinkedIn or something um, and it looks a little bit more professional. So if we look at the, I think we still have an output folder here. Output site assets and images, social commands. There we go. That's a weird font. Not sure why that font is there. Anyway, that's, um, so these are, these are rendered as part of the build process. I copied this from another module that uses uh, the pushover uh, API, which is for like push notifications, and they have kind of a scripty font. So um, I, I copied my repository uh, from that module. Uh, I must have copied the font somehow. Anyway, yeah, so when you do a build, it generates the cards. You can change the colors and, and formatting, and it's pretty flexible, especially if you're on the insiders, uh, if, if you have access to the insiders repository. Um, so if you, let's, let's actually take a look at their website here. So this is the insiders program for, for MKDocs uh, or material for MKDocs. Um, and you know, they describe all the different plugins and features that are available for insiders. All of these will be in the, uh, the normal MKDocs track. Um, at some point, once I hit the funding goals for them, um, a lot of them have already been released into the uh, the main uh, the main theme. Uh, but if we take a look at the social plugin as an example, um, they've rewritten that so that you can use uh, YAML and Jinja templates, and you can get like really your marketing team will love it. So if you want to. Uh, explore that, that's kind of fun. And let's see what else we got. So the awesome pages plugin, 
So I don't know, maybe I just don't know enough about MKDocs and the navigation, uh, the way that the navigation works, but if I want my documentation layout to look the way that it does uh, right now, uh, I define my navigation, uh, where is it? Ah, oh, there it is. So this nav section is how I'm, I'm defining the navigation. You don't have to manually define it, you can just um, pull this out, in fact, Let's do that. All right, so based on the structure of the, the files that are in my docs folder, um, that is how your website is going to get rendered by mkdocs. So I have, for example, a GH actions folder. If I go to docs, GH actions, and then there's a file there. If I go to uh, commands, there it is. Um, I got two files there. And if we look over here, this is how it rendered it. So it's got an ENUS folder, which I didn't really want. Um, and then my documentation is there. So in order to kind of squish my files um, all into the folder structure that I want, um, regardless of the way that it looks on disk. I'm using the Awesome Pages MKDocs plugin. And this is what's telling it to, to look in the commands folder under ENUS and then just find all the files that are in there alphabetically and squish them down into one sort of output folder in, uh, in the navigation. So you don't have to use that plugin, but it's one that, that I tend to use. Let's see. So Markdown extensions, these are purely um, features of MK or extensions to MKDocs itself. They're not related to uh, MKDoc or material for MKDocs. Um, and so, but a lot of the features that are in the material theme depend on having certain markdown extensions enabled. Um, so yeah, again, there's a lot of stuff that's in my copy of my MKDocs file or MKDocs configuration. Uh, start with a clean, simple file and add to it as you need to. Um, you know, so if I, for example, the pim down x highlight extension, uh, that is what gives me the ability to highlight specific areas of a code block. So if I go to update, so you notice how this section, I didn't have to highlight it, it's already highlighted. Um, that is defined in my documentation under platypus update. Where, there it is. So in my markdown, um, I just put in HL lines and then it highlights lines seven to nine. Um, and so that's codified into the markdown and rendered by, um, by MKDocs. So if I were to comment that out, uh, yeah, it's still, it's still there. I don't know. So there's sometimes some <laughs> uh, when you're when you're using MKDocs serve to uh, to run your documentation locally. There are sometimes some situations where you need to stop MKDocs and then start it again because I don't know it's got a plugin cached or something. And um, so I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to move on. But um, yeah. So. Let's see what else we got. Um, uh, task list, so if you wanted to do uh, a list of checkboxes in your documentation and you know, just it, it's visually appealing, um, then that will enable that feature in you know, that extension in the markdown format so that you can 
you know, use a square bracket or something like that. I think GitHub Markdown already sort of natively supports that, so that would probably look okay um, in GitHub. That is something that I haven't mentioned yet. So some of this documentation looks pretty good in the GitHub Pages website, but everything is available on GitHub, and GitHub will render Markdown. Um, so in some cases, you know, maybe your project doesn't even need a website, like you can just rely on, on GitHub and the way that it renders Markdown. Uh, for example, this is the, the home page. So I, I don't have a readme at the root of the repo because I wanted, for this project, I wanted the home page for the website to be the readme for GitHub. So GitHub will automatically look at either the root of your repository or a docs subfolder in your repository. It'll look for a readme to um, um, render here in GitHub itself. But it doesn't always render things the way that you'd want. So for example, I have a, a custom title in the markdown um, in the front matter, the little YAML block at the top of the markdown file. Uh, and uh, GitHub will go ahead and render that up here for you. So um, keep that in mind. You know, maybe the the files that you have for your your MK Docs project, uh, they're not necessarily going to look the same directly in GitHub. So if we look at a more complex file like, let's see, nope, that's source code. Let's go to. Yeah, so the a lot of the formatting looks fine. Some of it will look a little funny. So here's an example. Um, so I'm using the emoji or the the icon syntax for material for MKDocs. So if we look at the intro page for the MKDocs section. Scroll down, there we go. Um, so these cards, that's a feature of material for MKDocs, uh, but they don't necessarily render very nicely in GitHub. But I don't personally use or expect people to look at GitHub itself for my documentation. So, um, you know, tough luck. You should go to the website, um, which for my projects, I'll go ahead and hit this little edit button and then check that box to say, hey, you just use my GitHub pages website for, for the docs, and then it gives you your link there. Okay. Yeah, um, show of hands, who is uh, working in the GitHub code space and, um, and playing with the the module, the commands. Okay, yeah. Um, let me know if uh, if something's not working uh, in there, and um, yeah, if there's anything else in here that uh, that we should dive in deeper on. I know there was some. Yep. Maybe you can show how you like set up the repo. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna CD into the um, the sandbox folder and remove everything. Okay, so now that's empty. And then I'm gonna do a uh, new stucco, uh, do I not have that? Yeah, I probably don't have that installed. Okay, so I ran the command install module ps stucco, um, and then I'll do new stucco module, and I think it wants a path. Tab here, destination path, I'm just gonna do dot, because I want it in the folder that I'm in. 
Okay, so it launches the plaster template and it's just gonna go through and ask you some questions and it'll bootstrap the, the module for you. So we'll give it a name. And default to version 0.1.0, .0. .0. sure, I'll take that. And MIT license is the default, sure. Uh, or if you don't, you're not prepared to assign a license, don't do it. Um, code of conduct, meh. If, uh, I, for an actual project that I wanna share with people, I do tend to do the code of conduct and, and try to fill in all of those, those things just to set expectations. Um, so uh, do you want to include MKDocs support? And honestly, this is how I discovered MKDocs in the first place, was using the stucco module. So yes, please. Uh, MKDocs site name, at this point it doesn't really matter, because um, you can change it afterward. Uh, and same with the repository URL, um, I'll do just GitHub, because maybe you don't have this published to GitHub yet, so. Uh, will you uh, yeah, will you be using PowerShell classes? I'll say no. Uh, do you want to use Platypus for documentation? Yes. Do you want to include VS Code Dev Container Support? Sure. And then uh, yeah, I'll be using GitHub Actions. I'm trying to read that here. GitHub Actions. That's going to be an H. There we go. And now I have module structure. So if we Look at the files here. Close that. There we go. All right, so everything that's in the sandbox folder was just created with the stucco, uh, the new stucco module command. Um, so it created a folder for my dev container because I said I wanted dev container support. Um, it created the workflows, so that CI YAML, um, that's gonna describe how to actually build and, and run the tests and things. Um, it went ahead and created these issue templates, um, some default VS Code configuration, and uh, a docs folder with a placeholder, a little about um, folder, uh, mkdocs markdown file. With uh, with Platypus, anything that has an about underscore um, is going to be converted into an about topic in your documentation, um, which, so if you use git help and then about underscore star whatever topic you're trying to find, then it'll, it'll find that. So you can have documentation, uh, extended documentation in your modules um, that aren't necessarily attached to specific commands, uh, and those would be those about topics. Uh, and then it's got some default tests, uh, some other files. So it, it really scaffolds out everything that we've been talking about today. It'll create that for you. And then once it's there, you can, you can adjust and, and change things as, as you see fit. Um, it created our, our build PS1. That'll be our entry point. It created a default con, uh, mkdocs configuration. So, we're in our sandbox folder. We can do, let me make sure I don't have another web server running right now. That's all right on, it's on 8001. So we'll do a build. Okay, so the build failed because our documentation isn't complete. Uh, I'm pretty sure, let me scroll up here, yeah. So it ran the Saki tests and said, uh, hey, you have this progress action parameter, um, and I expected a value for the description, but didn't get one. Um, and so that helps to make sure that you don't publish document, or you know, publish modules of incomplete documentation. Um, but it did build. We can do, do we have a command? I think it gives you a hello world. Yeah. So there's a function there for uh, called get hello world. So if we do an mkdocs serve on this, we haven't done change any of the files yet. Um, we can do an mkdocs serve and open that up. And we don't have a home page right now. We just have this um, about 
dad jokes um, file there. So we had a 404 initially, but um, yeah, it went ahead and built the documentation and like this is ready to publish. Like you could just push it to GitHub pages right now uh, and then start adding commands. So if I go in um, and add a new command, Function, and of course I ran this in my, that's one thing that that frustrates me once in a while with VS Code uh, and the PowerShell extension is that if I run a long running command in this PowerShell extension terminal, um, all of your autocomplete stops working. So try not to do that. So I just ran mkdoc serve in a separate terminal. Uh, so that I can use my snippets that I depend a lot on. Okay, so I have a new function. Let's go ahead and do a build. And it's gonna fail because some of our documentation isn't complete, but I should now see the documentation for that command that we, we just created. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're if you starting a new project, uh, we were talking a little bit about you know whether I personally use uh, this, this module structure for everything that I do, and I don't. Um, you know, if I'm just tinkering around with something, a new API or, or something, I'm probably not doing this. But you could, so if you're, if you're, if you know that you wanna build a module, um, and and you know you could start here, new stucco module, get the everything scaffolded, and then just step through and start adding your functions. So the structure that it uses, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we have we did new stucco module and we called it dad jokes. So it created a subfolder in our uh, our path called dad joke, so it's gonna create a folder for the name of the module itself, and then inside that folder, it creates a private and a public folder. Um, in a lot of repos, you'll also see a classes folder and maybe an enums folder, uh, depending on if you use those features. Um, and that just kinda helps organize things in a way that it's kinda easy to find what you're looking for. Um, you know, if, if we look at the output from, from here, I used that compile feature that squished everything into one PSM1 file, and that's great for actually delivering the module and publishing it to the gallery, but when it comes to you know editing and just maintaining the module over time, when this gets to be hundreds and thousands of lines of code, um, it's it's just not fun. It's even if you're the only person working on the you know working on that code, it's it gets hard to figure out where you're at, where that function was in the file. So having them broken out into individual files is is really nice. Go back to sandbox. There we go. So. The PSM1 file that the stucco module generated for us, it is dot sourcing those private and, and public functions. So it's uh, doing a get child item and finding all the files uh, and then going through each one and then doing a dot import. Um, so just to import everything. And then because we did a get child item to find all of the files that are in the public folder, it's gonna grab the file name itself and export that as a public function. Um, so if you create a new function in here um, and call it uh, find dad joke, but you don't name it find dad joke, because the function name doesn't match the file name, this function isn't going to get exported. Uh, it's not gonna show up in the output when you import the modulator. So it's just a convention in 
the way that we're structuring this uh, um, the the source code to always have the file name, the base name for the file name match the function name. Otherwise, it's it's not going to show up. Yep. Ah, uh, let me think. No, I don't. I think you would still build those yourself, and you can you can drop those into the module, um, and yeah, it, it shouldn't. Add, yes, you can use you can use this module structure for for a DSC um, base module. You you look like you. Yeah. So if if we were to use a PowerShell class, um, then I would create a. New folder here. Um, when we did new stucco module, it asked us if we wanted to have support for classes. If we said yes, then it would automatically have this classes folder in here. And then we can put a class in there. Just a simple class um, that doesn't actually do anything yet. So we would need to, uh, in our PSM1 file, make sure that we add a line here to find our classes. And then make sure to import those. This isn't going to work, um, but just showing you. Uh, what it might look like. Um, it's not going to work because I think this, there's only one class in that, there's only one file in that folder, so it would show up as a object instead of an array of objects, and then I try to add one object to maybe another object or an array of objects, it's going to throw an error. Um, there's, yeah, yeah. And I think when I do a compile with, uh, with PowerShell build, um, it will go ahead and merge the, the class in. If we look at the, um, there are cases where you should do that and there are cases where you should maybe have the classes be in a separate file or maybe both. Uh, the reason I, I say that is because in this example module, if I go to my public, function here. So I set an output type uh, of, of dad joke. So it's a class. It's uh, outputting a class rather than a PS custom object. Um, and I think because I did that, this class needs to be available in the user's session in, in their scope outside of the module scope. Um, and that is accomplished by Uh, right here, scripts to process. So in the module manifest, it's looking in the classes folder and essentially dot sourcing that dadjoke.ps1 file that has the class definition in it in the user's session so that the user session knows that that class exists and understands the output type of that function. Um, if you don't do that, if you're only using the classes for internal purposes, then you wouldn't have to do that and it would be totally fine to have all the classes um, just sitting in the top of the PSM1 file. Um, so classes in PowerShell are kind of funky. <laughs> uh, let's see. Anything else about this structure? Uh, go back down to my sandbox. There it is. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about the dependencies. So if we look at the requirements.psd1 file, this was also generated by Stucco. Uh, and so this is using a module called psdepend. So our build file, the, so our entry point for this is going to bootstrap. If we do a dash bootstrap, it's going to uh, check and install the PS depend module if it's not already available, and then it's going to call invoke PS depend on that requirements file. 
So then it's gonna look at our requirements and say, uh, okay, it looks like they need version 5.4 of Pester in order to build this, so we'll make sure that that's installed um, and skip publisher check because uh, if you might, if you have an older version of Pester already installed that was signed by a different certificate than the one that's available on the PS Gallery, it'll throw an error. Um, so you can you can override that. You know, it needs Saki, it needs build helpers. So these are all the default modules that are part of this um, scaffolded project. You don't need to use all of these um, in your projects. They're completely, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways to build a, a PowerShell module. Um, but uh, in this case, this is what uh, the scaffold would use. So when we call build with, yep. Correct, yeah, so if we look at the, uh, the module manifest itself, the mod, uh, what's it called, dependent modules, where is it? Required modules, there are none. So this module doesn't, like if you're the user of it, you don't need all of those modules, but if you are building the module as a developer, um, the build environment needs all of those in order to, in order to do the build and um, yeah, process all that. Let's see. There we go. Uh, so yeah, uh, so the build script, uh, once the dependencies are installed, uh, it'll go ahead and um, do call set build environment. So just so we, we can see the effect of that. Let's run it here. Okay, it doesn't look like it did anything, but if we do a get child item, env bh. So we're gonna look at our environment variables that start with bh for build helpers. It created some environment variables that we can now use in our Saki file or our, um, our pipeline, wherever we need to, uh, and the PowerShell build module uses these in order to uh, figure out um, what's the project path, like where in the file system is this module, um, where's it going, so there's a build output folder there, um, the module manifest path, all of these things uh, are available during the build um, as environment variables. And then it will invoke the Saki file and specify the task. So the default task is going to be test by default. Um, that's an argument completed. There we go. Excuse me. The default task is default. So what does that mean? Let's look at our Saki file and the default settings. So with Pester. Again, Pester is just a way of running tasks, running scripts sort of by name. Um, and so there's, if you don't provide the name of a task, then it's going to use default. So you need to tell Saki what task is your default task. And so in this case, it says it depends on test. And so in order for you to run default, you need to first run test. And so that's how it, kind of decides how to enter this, this build process. And so down here it's importing the test task from PowerShell build. <coughs> so it says from module PowerShell build, and then we have a min version here saying uh, like, go find the PowerShell build module. There's a task in there that I want you to use, but make sure to get version 6061 at, at a minimum. Um, and then it'll go ahead and import the tasks from there. Yeah. That was through build helpers. So yeah, yeah, so if we look at our, uh, our build script, uh, is that the right one? Yep, so when we call the build.ps1, which in this structure, like that 
ideally is your entry point for everything. You always start with build.ps1, and then maybe you want to just do a build, maybe you just want to do a test, maybe you want to generate the docs or something. You can create your own custom tasks, but you start with build, and then you set up Saki with the tasks that you want to run. So this build script is going to call set build environment before it calls your Saki scripts, your Saki file. Um, so it'll, and that module is build helpers, bh, uh, no, it's just build helpers. Um, and yeah, so build helpers is a module that generates the environment variables. And then those environment variables are used in PowerShell build in the, in the Saki tasks that are there. So I, it's a lot of different modules, a lot of different pieces, um, but you can kind of think of the PowerShell build tasks as just an extended Saki file. Um, so you can, uh, I've got a couple of ta uh, custom tasks defined here, um, but if you wanted to use PowerShell build, um, you can just reference those tasks. So in PowerShell build, there are Saki files, uh, or there's a Saki file that has tasks like this. But instead of copying and pasting those into my Saki file, I'm just saying I'm, wanting to use, I'm gonna go use that one. Go find it. Okay. Yeah, and that's kind of it for the um, for the scaffolding. So once it's there, you just try to stick to the convention of putting any private functions in the private folder, public functions in the public folder, kind of self-explanatory. Um, you can choose to um, uh, compile those down if you want to. The default is just to copy copy it as is into the output and publish the module that way. Um, so uh, you can ask a question. PowerShell is kind of funny with that. Um, I don't know if it's an industry standard. I do know that when I've read through some of the Microsoft sort of internal PowerShell module documentation, um, like they have comments about their own conventions for developers that work on the PowerShell um, uh, module about you know, the file names and um, and things. And uh, so, yeah, I think they do kind of follow that convention. One of the reasons you would do that is, uh, well, it's, so there's a couple of reasons. Um, visually, just looking at your function that you're working on, it makes it easier to know um, without having a deep knowledge of, of the module of the project, whether something is a public function or not. Um, but also when it comes to linting, which is the process of like looking at your source code and making sure that you're following a certain set of conventions uh, consistently. Um, one of the conventions is verb dash noun. Uh, and also there are um, a set of verbs that are recommended that you stick to. Um, so, you know, when you want to get something, it's get, not, you know, go find or something. Um, and so if you have a private function that doesn't follow the convention, um, so it uses, you know, get, uh, go find dash something, then you might get a linting error that says, oh, you've got a, or PS script analyzer might say, hey, you've got a, uh, you're not following the convention here. And so by having it just be one word and maybe, you know, uh, what is it? Is it camel case or? I always forget. Yeah, Pascal case where you have the the lower uh, lowercase first letter and um, anyway, you, you might use whatever convention you want to use. But yeah, I, I tend to do that with my private functions is have them be yeah, one word. Oh. There is a deep, so I haven't done anything in this particular project um, for PS Script Analyzer, but there are default, um, it does use PS Script Analyzer. So if we run the test, it 
Did it run PS script analyzer? There's an analyze step, so maybe I passed. Uh, what was that? Uh, there's a so there should be some default um, PS script analyzer uh, like you don't you don't need a configuration file for PS script analyzer you can add one uh, but I think I'm just not breaking any conventions yet. Okay. So I was going to I was going to generate something that I know would cause PS script analyzer to throw an error, but my default VS code settings uh, are set up to trim trailing white spaces. So well, as soon as I hit save, that all disappears. It's not worth it. <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. Bless you. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. And there's the the so we we broke the convention and um, we got the PS script analyzer you know use approved verbs warning there. So, yep. It's it's a part of the 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 default build and test pipeline when you use that stucco module to to bootstrap your or to scaffold your module. Uh, let's see, some of the tests. So if you look at the test output here, um, one of the cool things about automating your documentation um, is that you can also automate your, you know, some of your, your help. Like you can check and make sure. So this, by default, if I try to publish this module, it's going to fail because I haven't defined descriptions and things like there's placeholders in my markdown files that Platypus created that still need to be filled out. And so it's automatically going to fail the test, um, which is what's happening down here, um, because those, those aren't documented yet. Um, but one of the things that I've done as well with documentation, and I think I'll uh, go over to my blog under, and yeah, the blog is built with MK Docs. Um, let's see, parsing code from Markdown files. Uh, so one of the things that I did with my uh, my Milestone PS Tools module is um, it, that module has evolved over time. So I think I started it in 2019, and. I had just learned PowerShell and was not following all of the, the right conventions and things. So it's it's evolved and changed a lot over time. And uh, one of the things that I discovered was, oh, I should probably start prefixing my nouns with um, you know a couple of letters so that I don't have collisions. Like if, in our software, I might create a new user. So you know, new dash user. Uh, well, there's a lot of other modules that might collide with. Um, <laughs> And it did. So I started uh, using new dash VMS user uh, video management system, um, but I didn't want to break everybody's scripts that they'd already written um, by 
you know, getting rid of the, the uh, new user command. So I created an alias for new user, but I don't want my documentation to show the aliases, like so you know, show in the example parts of my documentation, I don't want people to use that and say, oh, new user, that's the right command to use. I want them to use the, the right command, new dash BMS user. Um, and so I wanted to automatically go through the almost 300 commands in the module to find all the places where I might be using an alias. Um, also like the question mark for where object or the percent sign for for each object, those, um, you know, maybe I don't want to have those in the documentation either. I want to use the full uh, words so that people who are kind of new to PowerShell maybe are a little bit more comfortable um, uh, reading, reading those examples. Um, so I had written uh, some functions to go and look for code fences in my markdown um, and then use the abstract syntax tree, and this is kind of getting into the weeds, but it's um, it, it goes through and it finds uh, and parses the PowerShell so that it'll tell me whether or not I'm using commands or whether I'm using aliases. And then I can have in my pipeline an automatic step to make sure that I don't accidentally publish um, uh, documentation that uses aliases. Uh, and so that, that really helped me go through and find all the places that I needed to update those functions. So. Yes. And I think, nope. Yeah, I think that's a part of this blog, but um, that's that's essentially what it was doing was parsing the, uh, it's doing a little bit of both. So yeah, it'll parse the all of the code blocks that it finds that have PowerShell uh, shown as like the language for that script block um, and then parse that through PS, pass it through PS Script Analyzer and also do um, looking for my my custom aliases and things. Yeah, so the default tests that are in here, um, there's some help tests. So this is this uh, pester test file is what goes through and, and imports the help and then looks through and makes sure that um, you know, everything is correct. So making sure that it's not uh, auto-generated so it's not um, those placeholders, making sure that everything has a description, that it has at least one example, um, that the help link is valid. So if you, um, that's one thing that I haven't done in this module is set up the help link. So if we do uh, docs. All right, so we have our module imported. If I do help get dad joke, which um, if you don't know any command that starts with get for the verb, you can just omit the verb and just type help. So instead of get help, you can just type help. Um, so this is cool, we can see it in, in the terminal uh, and we, we know that we have online documentation, but if you're in the terminal already and you wanna look at the online documentation, um, you can do dash online, but this version of the documentation doesn't have any online help. Uh, so if I go to, let me figure out what the URL is real quick. Nope. All right, so I have my URL. I'm gonna go into my help under docs and commands, get dad joke. 
And there's this online version section at the top. So I'll put in the address, save, and let's do a build. And hope we didn't break something. Cool. So it went ahead and built that. Uh, so now if I import from the compiled module, so I'll go in to my output folder and docs workshop. And if I look at ENUS, here's the mammal file that Platypus generated. And if I look for joshuaj.com in there, there we go. So I put that in the markdown. Um, and then when we did a build, Platypus looked at the markdown files, it generated a new mammal file uh, and included the link to the online help in the mammal file. So now if I were to import the module and do help, get dad joke, oh no. Uh, yeah, that's what I did, thanks. There we go, that should do it. Or not. Let's open up a new terminal. Oh, that's what it is, okay. Yeah, because I'm in a code space, it's, uh, it's not wanting to do that. So let's go ahead and commit the changes. Oops. All right, and then I am going to open this locally so that I can pull those changes in and then we can see it work. So uh, code, C repos, sessions, docs. All right, so it's the same, uh, same project, but opening it on my local machine instead of Ooh, too, too much, there we go. And I'm not gonna open it in a dev container because then I probably run into the same problem, um, but I am gonna do a sync, and I'm gonna discard. Uh, that one I'm not too worried about, or too sure about. Uh, I'll do a git pull, there we go. And I'll do a build locally. Okay, so it did a restore of the NerdBank Git version, command line interface, running all my Saki tasks, running my pester tests, everything passed. Now I can do, well, let me see if it's loaded, Git module. Um, Nope, good. So import module, IPMO, output, um, import module, build process. Oh, this is because, Okay, um, cool. So get help, get dad joke online. Whew. Yay! <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's a task to automate putting the online uh, URL in there because it could be like the actual path could be anywhere under that domain. It just kind of depends on where you put it. Um, but that's um, like for modules that I've done, I've 
just you know written out a quick PowerShell script to find all the commands and then go find the the markdown files and then do a regex replace or something on that that line of the markdown file or you know for a smaller module just go and manually put in the, the addresses so yeah I uh, let's open it up to questions I'm kind of I've gone through everything here right so uh, as far as your your the commands that you're going to have in your module and, and everything, or yeah. So so if you do new stucco module and then you just immediately after do a build, it's going to stub out your documentation files then in Markdown, and once they're there, you just fill in the blanks. So you can go into the and edit the Markdown files directly, um, or if you write your commands, uh, your PowerShell commands, and you happen to include comment-based help in those commands, then the first time that you run a build, it's going to see your, 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 your comment-based help, and it's gonna put those into the markdown files for you, uh, but then, yeah, you'd edit them afterward. You do if you are not using this structure. Yeah, so if, if you use the, the, the structure, the scaffolding produced by um, new stucco module, then when you call build, it is going to do uh, new markdown help um, and generate new markdown files for any commands that don't already exist in that markdown folder. Um, and it'll do an update markdown help on commands that are already there um, in that that have already been the markdown files have already been generated. It'll do update markdown help on those. Is that what you find in yeah, yeah. Uh, but as, as Sean was saying, um, there are cases where maybe that isn't going to work out well for you. Um, and and make sure to use version control. Uh, so so Sean was saying that um, you might have like you know create a copy of your documentation, your markdown, uh, and then do update um, markdown help against the copy, and then just copy across the changes, the things that you want to include in your online documentation um, or in your, your MAML file as well. Uh, if you're using version control, you could also just make sure that any changes are committed, and then when you run build and it updates your markdown help, um, you'll be able to see the diff in, you know, Git will show you that diff and then you can undo something if you don't like it or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I am actually going to pull up my blog because I think I wrote about that and it'll just refresh my memory. Um, but versions are, there's a lot of different ways you might do versioning. Um, maybe I didn't. There it is. Cool. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways you might do versioning. Um, you can do it by hand uh, and just manually uh, bump the version when you want to, you know, publish something. Um, you could, uh, and what I've used in the past was to have a function that goes out and looks at the most recent available version of the module on PowerShell Gallery, and then bump the version up from there, and that works really well. Um, you, you could just use that. Um, what I started using, uh, because we've used it in other projects that are uh, unrelated to PowerShell at work, is um, uh, nerdbank.gitversioning, which is a .NET CLI tool. Um, and what that does is it looks at your Git uh, branch uh, and your, your commit history, and it generates a version number based on the Git uh, or the, the, the commit height. So when you create a new branch from, you know, from main, your Git height is zero. So you haven't committed anything yet. Um, when you make changes and you do a commit, then your git height is one. You do another commit, your git height is two. Um, and if we look at the version.json, 
This is saying that my base version is 0 0.1. Thank you, five minutes. We got uh, a base version of 0 0.1, so the git height is gonna be added um, to that last segment. So it'll be 0 0.1.1234, whatever the git height is uh, on that branch. And then, yep. Uh, uh, I always forget with so with Semver and with with other things, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be the it'll in this case it'll update the patch version. If I if I had like zero dot one dot five, then it'll update the revision number. I think is what I, the the fourth one is called. I try not to use four segments in my versions though. Um, so yeah, it'll increment the patch number. So if we do a uh, git module. And I think it's this one right here. So 0 0.1.22, I didn't come up with the 22, that's the git height uh, of the, the main branch right now. Um, and there's also, um, you can have git, uh, so I am grabbing the simple version out of NerdBank git versioning, but it'll also give you the, the commit hash and include that at the end. So it'll be like your 0 0.1.22 dash and then the commit which makes it really nice and easy to go and figure out like the, what version of this, uh, or, you know, in our source code, where did this version of the module come from? And you can go exactly to that commit. Um, but yeah, for, for publishing to the gallery, I just use the, um, the simple, you know, 0 0.1 dot whatever. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's different strategies. Uh, I like, I like NerdBank because I, I don't have to think about the version numbers and I don't have to worry that I might somehow accidentally, I don't know, uh, if I'm working with multiple people, uh, it's, there's less likely that we're gonna have issues with the version. We don't even have to think about it. Um, also, uh, if I'm not using PS Gallery, um, then so if you rely on the version, you know, you query PS Gallery and get the latest version, that then adds a dependency to the gallery in your build pipeline, and maybe that is important uh, or a, a potential problem, maybe not. If you're just publishing to the gallery anyway, then I mean, if it's down, you're not gonna publish, it's gonna fail anyway. So um, yeah, something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I have not done that. Well, all right, I'll take that back. In the project that I'm working on now, um, we're using the git submodules feature, which basically uh, I just learned how to use submodules recently. Um, is, so you have your, your repository and then you might reference other repositories in your, your repository. So you have like these nested Git repositories. Um, and it, so you, you, the base repo is only referencing the, the location of, of that submodule, that sub repo. Um, and then when you do a Git submodules in it or something like that, it'll go in and like recur you can recursively pull all of those repos and, and the right branches and stuff. Um, so in this project we have, uh, I, I'm still following this process where I, I build the module and then M, uh, Platypus generates the docs, but it's generating the docs outside into another subfolder that is tied to the docs repo. So the, the guy that's doing the technical documentation is um, like, that's the only repo that he looks at. He doesn't load like the whole, the big repository. Um, and so when I do uh, a change to one of the modules, then it'll show up in his repo and end up in the product. Um, so yeah, you, you, can, you can absolutely do it. It's just, yeah, it can be tricky. Cool. Yeah, so we got uh, we got three minutes left. Uh, I'm gonna be here until until the end, but uh, I think we've reached the end here. So thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>